At the south end of the Cape Perpetua area is Cook's Chasm. Right, here's the bridge going over Cook's Chasm and there's a parking lot here that you can park. Go across the bridge and to the other side of the inlet here and we can see, hopefully, Spouting Horn. So, let me go out here a bit. And look down below. So here's our basalt head rock up. There went Spouting Horn. Here's our basalt bedrock. Wave erosion in the past has cut into this basalt exposed here. And now we have a relatively flat surface down there. We call that a wave cut platform. The platform itself has again been uplifted so that now it is above the incoming waves. And there is water sitting on the rock there, but that's just, you know, splash. The highest waves will splash water up there. Normally at low tide, it would not be covered. So this area of volcanic bedrock has natural fractures that are relatively perpendicular to the coastline. So as the waves are coming in, the water is being forced up into these natural fractures and the fractures widen, but the platform has been raised up enough that it actually starts out as a tunnel. And it's only when the top of the tunnel gets thin enough that it falls in and then you get a wide channel like this. So if I move a little bit closer in, you can see how the channel is getting more narrow. It's actually wider down below underneath, but this is the remains of a roof that had been sitting above that channel. Now spouting horn, there it goes again, spouting horn occurs because there's a side channel that's been eroded. Back into the rock next to, so this is the main channel, and then there's a side channel back over there, and as the water comes in, it goes into a sea cave underneath there and there's a very small hole at the top and the water comes up out of that hole like a spout from a whale. And that's why it's called spouting horn. Now, not every surge of water that comes into the channel causes the horn to spout. It has to hit it in just the right way in order for it to generate the spout. Now this rock, up yep, there it goes again. This configuration of the rocks is not the same as it was in the past. There was a while there where rocks had fallen in. You see the one rock that's kind of in the middle of the, down in the channel right, you know, there, okay. Rocks have fallen in. This channel used to be quite a bit narrower down there, but it's broken through and eventually, you know, you can, I think the, the, these two, the smaller channel up there and then this one that has the rock sitting in down in there that gets inundated once in a while. Oh, there's a good spout. They're going to become connected to each other. Woo, there's a big one. That was a big wave. Cook's Chasm, you really can't see much because the vegetation has kind of covered over the erosional divot. Okay, and on the other, uh, between here and the 
place I stopped where I gave, gave you a shot of the bedrock of the bottom of Cape Perpetua, uh, there's a place called Devil's Churn, which they have closed because of COVID. But Devil's Churn is another channel that's like this. Um, the, the sides of the cliff above it, though, is such that you can look almost straight down into it. This is a lot wider of a vista that we can see here. So the water comes in here and really gets tossed around. And you don't have to have very big of waves in order to be able to see spouting horn work. Get it even closer here. So, 20 years from now, this wide area will probably, you know, 100 years from now, this will be wide all the way back. And if we have sea level rise, then that, that width will increase just that much faster. Now over here, in the distance is a feature that we call Thor's Well. Now you can see the edge of the wave cup platform and kind of right where those people are standing, if you look straight out from them, like that guy in the orange hat, if you look straight out from him, there is like a hole in the wave cup platform. See the water going back down into it? Now a wave comes in that's a sea cave down underneath there where the roof has fallen in. So a wave will come in and the water will come up out of that hole and then it drains back down into the hole and then here comes the water again with the next wave. That water spreads out over the wave cut platform and eventually some of it leaks back down into the hole. Okay, so the fractures there um, are smaller and a couple of them have met down underneath there and the roof fell in. So now we call it Thor's Well. There's the water coming up out of it. Going back into it. Here comes another big wave. It's gonna fill it up. Woo! And then it kind of goes over the top of the platform, seeps back down in. Here comes another big wave. There, fills it up. Water seeps back down in. So, Again, over time, the front part, that front wall of Thor's well, is gonna get broken through. It's gonna get broken through, and then Thor's well won't work anymore. Right, there won't be that impetus for the water to come up like that and then drain back down. So the coastline is ever changing. It's never the same. Things are gonna get eroded away. New erosional features are gonna develop. So every time you come out here, it's gonna be a little bit different. Now I was saying, when I was at, what was it, Strawberry Hill, that there was a dike, an igneous dike. And I said that there's lots of them out here at Cape Perpetua, okay? So let me see if from up here, I can point them out to you. So look at the gentleman, whoops, with the orange stripe, right? He's got a gray sweatshirt on and an orange stripe at the bottom. His shirt is orange. Directly above their heads, you'll see a kind of a linear thing, almost looks like it's stairs going out towards Thor's well. That's a dike. So it starts here just right off the edge of the vegetated part you can see it and it goes along kind of goes breaks and ends up starting a, a little bit further to the right in that one sandy area and then it keeps on going goes out there where the water is and it's gonna end up out there towards that end side of Thor's well okay very often the rock of an igneous dike is harder less easy to weather and road away than the rock that it is actually coming up through. And so it will appear as a wall like it did at Strawberry Hill. Okay, we have another one also here, but it's closer over towards this other channel. 
you look down over this spruce and there's some people walking right past this spruce top okay you look down past them there's an area where it's kind of a bright green where there's algae and you can see a little bit coming this way but also going back out that way so relatively parallel to the first dike that i showed you and you can see it looks subtly different there's a line going like this a little bit taller here it gets lower and then you see it go back up again so there's just two dikes that are big enough that you can actually see them from this distance away. I have taken the path, you can take this pathway from this parking lot, you can take the pathway down to here, and then you keep on going that way. And the pathway, you can uh, walk on it to the north. And in fact, that's how you get down here from the main parking lot up by the visitor center. And we have counted as many as 16 dikes cutting across this basalt. Some of them are three feet wide, like the ones that I've tried to point out to you down here. Some of them are only six inches wide. But like I said, they usually stand up as a kind of a wall because they don't erode as easily. And a feature develops in them, especially when they're wider like this, a lot of times called columnar jointing. Columnar jointing occurs in basalt as it's cooling and the cooling starts from the outside like so for an igneous dike that's coming up like this it's going to start cooling on you know where it's coming up through the rock and it cools towards the inside and it forms columns. Now in this case those columns are falling are over on their side they're horizontal okay if it was a lava flow then you could get really really tall columns that are vertical okay now let's take a look at Cape Perpetua itself there's Cape Perpetua in the distance can you see the lines in it the lines going across Cape Perpetua is the remains of a shield volcano it was formed out of lava flow after lava flow back, what, 35 to 40 million years ago by a hot spot somewhere that was out there off the coast. 35 to 40 million years ago, North America was not as far west as it is now. So in that subsequent amount of time, as the continent was going west, those hot spot volcanoes ended up being scraped off the downgoing plate, the subducting plate, and attached to the edge. And all the, you know, the, all the volcanic rocks that I've been showing you are part of that volcanism that happened that formed this shield volcano. It didn't all happen at once necessarily, but it's the same, you know, the hot spot is the reason that this basalt got in place. That hot spot is now the one that's underneath Yellowstone. That's how much North America has continued to move west the hot spot stays in place and the plate moves over it. And so now clear over there in the northwest corner of Wyoming, that's where the hot spot is now. Okay. So like I said, way up there on top, 800 feet high, and you can see on a clear day, 35 miles out to sea. Now we've got a cloudy day today, but it's lifted up off the surface a bit. And so you can see quite a long ways out there. So there's multiple trails here at Cape Perpetua. There are the ones that come down to the Wave Cup platform uh, over where you can see the cars in the distance over there. Uh, that's past Devil's Churn. There's trails that also go down there on the Wave Cup platform there. If you are up at the visitor center, they have more than a couple trails that go up into the woods. Um, right now they've got all blocked off because we have such a high fire danger that they don't want anybody actually do, using the trails up into the woods. Um, but it's a fantastic spot to come. If the tide is really low, uh, you can get some good tide pooling in down here off of these wave cut platforms. It's just a really beautiful spot and well worth visiting at some time in your future if you haven't already been here.